If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Matthew's Gospel. We're going through the Gospel of Matthew, and we find ourselves in chapter 3. The title of the message is Baptisms. The Bible speaks of seven to nine different baptisms, and so as we're going to be looking at this baptism of Jesus, John the Baptist, in preparation for the Messiah and the New Covenant and all that's taking place here, historically, before Jesus would even set out in ministry, we would see a baptism. And then uh, chapter 4 in Matthew's Gospel show us the wilderness fasting of 40 days and being tempted by the devil. And then Jesus' ministry would take off from that point on. So just encourage you guys, uh, we're going through the scriptures verse by verse. A lot of new faces want to welcome you. Hopefully um, you received an invite and you were faithful to accept it. So you are welcome. If you don't have a church home, we encourage you guys to, to worship with us. We are a body of believers. Calvary Chapel Living Water uh, just said on watching God be glorified. And as we go through the grace and knowledge of his word, just what a blessing to be able to grow through his word and that's how the Bible declares we grow as Christians faith comes by hearing and not by the Word of God um, and interesting as I was looking at the different baptism and reading different articles man there's a, a little confusion out there on on what the Bible teaches and it's the beauty of being able to study the Bible inductively helps um, helps steer away from some of those false beliefs and false doctrines that are out there believe it or not if you study the Bible inductively through observation, interpretation, and application, and you allow the context of what the scriptures is teaching to be able to guide you, you're not coming with a preconceived idea of the Bible has to say this, or I heard that it says this, so let me see if I can justify that. No, that's not how we study the Word of God. We come to the Word of God and we let the Bible speak for itself in the context of what the Bible is declaring. And so there's one true interpretation for the scriptures, and that's God's. And it's up to us to dig and to search and to study. The Bible declares to show ourselves approve, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so it's kind of neat that you're able just to do this inductively and allow the scriptures to speak for themselves. Let God be true and every man a liar, the Bible declares. And so again, we just come to the scriptures. We allow them to speak for themselves. We're going to be in Matthew's Gospel Chapter 3. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you so much that you desire to shed light where there is darkness. And Lord, that light illuminates. It exposes it reveals the truth of what you have to say. And Lord, you promise that you will lead us and guide us into all truth. And so I just thank you for this time that we have together. Thank you, Lord, that we can grow in the grace and knowledge of your word and an understanding of your heart for us. And so, Father, we pray that you would speak to us through your word. Bless this time as we offer it up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week I was struck with covid I never got diagnosed. I've taken two tests and I have yet to receive the results. So I am the healthiest person in here. <laughs> I can't give you COVID for another three to six months. That's what the CDC tells me at least. I don't know how true that is. But for at least three months, I guess I cannot be contagious and I cannot give you anything. So I'm pretty happy about that. I tell people that I come to church to get COVID. I've had it twice, and I got it both times from church. And so we are a super spreader group, I guess. I don't know what to tell you about that. Um, but again, I just when this whole thing started back 2019 and early 2020, I just got a word from the Lord, and He said, "Hey, don't fear, just trust." And as we go through this together, it's it's tough, and we know that people have gotten ill. We know that people have died and we don't minimize it uh, anytime that I think I'm diagnosed I stay home and I isolate so I did that for another 10 days and that's a very difficult thing for me personally because I love people 
and I love to be around people. And so last week, Joshua had an opportunity to share with you, and he shared um, out of just zeal, being passionate for the right things. And in that, he said that um, the Lord was placing upon his heart two areas of zealousness, and that was a love for God and a love for people. And so we need to receive love from God and be zealous about that, be passionate about that. Zeal and passion are synonyms. And so zeal is one of my favorite um, emotions. It's one of my favorite attributes that I see within people. But being zealous for the right things, having a zeal for the right things is very important as well. I've seen people be zealous for things that you just like shake your head and you wonder like, wow, why'd you pick that one? But to be zealous for love and receiving that love that God has for us is a wonderful thing. And then being able to be a dispenser of that love. We're able to love because we've received that love. And so, is that my phone? or Do we know what that is? That's the second time. The board? Yeah. All right. Okay. So last week's message, a message on zeal, and, a, and the zeal was twofold. It was a being zealous for God and receiving the love of God, but also being zealous for loving people. And so I had gone through Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 1 through, I think I did uh, about 12. Let me see. Yes, verses 12. And so we'll go over those again because the title of the message being baptisms and ma uh, Matthew here mentioning baptisms within that section of scripture. Um, <clears throat> so I'll reiterate a little bit of what I shared. Uh, the title of my message two weeks ago was uh, the first word. And the first word out of John the Baptist's mouth would be repentance. The first word out of Jesus' mouth in his ministry would be repentance. The first word out of the day of Pentecost when Peter's preaching is repentance. The disciples were declared to go out and they teach a message on repentance. And so this word repentance just kept coming up. And I liken repentance to um, what we choose to focus on. The Bible declares that we are saved by God's grace. There's nothing that we can do of a work to add to that. And so is repentance a work? Some would say yes, some would say no. Is repentance required for salvation? I gave the picture of being in New York, of what repentance looks like, being in New York, and from New York coming to California. And it could be what we choose to look at. We can choose to look at coming to California and what that looks like, or we can choose to think about and be nostalgic and romantic about all the things that we're missing when we leave New York. And so where's our focus? And that's kind of coming to Christ. That's becoming a Christian. In repentance, we're leaving our old life and we're coming to Christ in repentance. So we're now looking to Jesus. I have chosen from the very beginning to simply look to Jesus in my repentance. I don't care what has happened in the past as far as what I can be romantic and nostalgic about. All I remember is hangovers and drug addiction and ruined relationships and God delivered me from that. So I don't get too nostalgic about, oh, I'm missing hangovers and I'm missing drug addiction and I'm missing ruining people's lives. I look more to what God has given me when I came to Christ and He gave me the ability to do what I always wanted to do, which is the greatest working definition of faith that I've ever heard. The ability to do what you know you ought to do. God gave me the power to do what I desired to do from the very, very beginning. And so in that, my faith is and repentance is looking to Jesus. And yes, I've left the old life. I've left that life of sin that I used to live. But man, what I found in Christ is so incredible. And it hasn't diminished. It hasn't uh, changed. It's just a wonderful thing. So we looked at that in repentance. Let's go ahead and take a look at Matthew's Gospel. We'll Read it from the beginning, verses 1 through 12 are just a reiteration, and then we're going to look at these different aspects. And in this section right here that we're reading, that I already taught two weeks ago, there's a mention of three different baptisms, and we'll look at those, because the title of the message is Baptisms. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
John the Baptist's ministry is one of preparation for the new covenant. The Messiah is on the scenes. Let's get ready to hear the message of the, of the Messiah. And so it goes on, For this is he who was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. I mentioned that his diet and his dress were not a hindrance to the work of God that God had called him to. And so a little different, a little eclectic John the Baptist, a little out there, if you will, but he was singularly focused on what God was calling him to. And so that's why it mentions his diet and his dress. Verse 5, Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. And so again, it's just a preparation for the Messiah who is on the scene. Verse 7, when he, when, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the wrath to come, Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And then notice he mentions these baptisms. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He mentions three baptisms there. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. <clears throat> John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. And I find it interesting because he sees the religious leaders and he says, who warned you guys? Who warned you to come? Who warned you to, to come to my ministry and to get ready to receive this message? You better show fruits worthy of repentance. And I find it interesting because it sounds like John the Baptist is making the new covenant even more difficult than the old covenant. And the very opposite is true. But because they have a faulty foundation, he wants them to know you guys are messed up from the very beginning. And this first covenant, it's like a root. And the axe is laid at the root of these roots of Judaism. And God's going to start a whole new system with this new covenant as the Messiah is coming. And he's on the horizon. He's on the scene. So this faulty, self-righteous thing that you guys got working, you need to get rid of it. And understand that this is a thing of God's grace. As so I again, I find that interesting because he's talking to the religious leaders and it's almost like he's making it to let them know this foundation that you guys have is messed up. God's about to chop this system down and we're going to go with a new system, but your system, your foundation is faulty. It's based on an outward show of what you're doing and you guys have set up this religious system that God is not pleased with. And God is about to whack the whole system. Again, that's just an interesting dynamic right there in and of itself. So the baptisms that are mentioned here, the three, are number one, John's baptism is a baptism of repentance in preparation for the Messiah. And that's not salvation, that's preparation. Just get ready. The Messiah has some good news that he's going to come and he's going to share. And you guys need to get your hearts ready to receive that. that that's John the Baptist. But and then he says there's one coming who I'm not even worthy to carry his sandals. Not to tie them. I'm not even worthy to carry them. And so I'm not worthy of the lowest slave's job to be able to carry this one's sandals. So in humility, John recognizes I'm not the Messiah. In John's gospel, um, they would question John, you know, who are you? Are you Elijah? Are you the, the foreteller? Are you the one? And he, John definitely knows who he is by, not, by knowing who he's not. He said, I'm just a voice crying in the wilderness. And when it's all said and done, this one who is coming, he must decrease, he must increase, and I must decrease. I need to be pointing to him. And that was John's whole ministry, John the Baptist. 
So he says, this one that is coming is going to baptize you. And again, it's in verse 10. Therefore, every tree which does not, let's see, I indeed baptize you with water, verse 11, to repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you, notice, with the Holy Spirit and fire. Two baptisms mentioned there. So the Holy Spirit is being immersed. Baptism is never anything of sprinkling. It's an immersion. It's a full, you know, baptism is a picture of the gospel. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so we identify with Jesus in baptism in the fact that we die to self. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. But the life which I live, I live by the power of the Son of God who is in me, right? And so in baptism, symbolically, we are put in this watery grave and our sins are dead there. We die to that self-life, that old man. And we are resurrected, if, if you will, as we come out of the water in newness of life. Is baptism necessary for salvation? No. It's an outward show of an already inward work. If you or I have yet to be baptized as a Christian, we would have to ask ourselves, why? Why haven't you been baptized? I just haven't got around to it. Or there hasn't been an opportunity. Or I never even really thought about it. It's an identification with Jesus. And he, we're going to see in chapter 3, was baptized to identify with us. How much more do we need to identify to be baptized to identify with him. Okay? So baptism. It's, it's a necessary thing. But it's not a required thing. It's an outward show. Of an already inward work. Something happened internally inside. We are born again when we become Christians. And then we identify with Jesus in baptism. Now. First century AD. Baptism was a death march. You baptize, you were baptized as a Christian, and the next thing would be martyrdom. You would be killed identifying with Jesus, getting away from Judaism. And so, big deal back then. For us, it's just ah, identification with Jesus. Okay. So he says, baptized with the Holy Spirit, immersed into the body of Christ. That's one baptism. When you became born again, you were immersed, baptized into the body of Christ. Of Christ. Jesus, the Bible says, is the head of the church and we are his body. We are his hands and his feet. We are his listening ears and his mouthpiece. We are the body of Christ. We've been given gifts and God does his work through his body on the earth. And so he wants to use you, he wants to use me in the lives of individuals that we come in contact with as the body of Christ. And so we are baptized into the body of Christ according to the scriptures in 1 Corinthians. Now it would go on to say that he gave some to be in Ephesians chapter 4. And then he names these different offices within the church. Um, evangelists, uh, pastors, teachers. For the equipping of the saints. For the edification or the building up of the body of Christ. And so you've been given a gift or several gifts to be used to edify or build up the body of Christ. And sometimes, a lot of times, that happens within the local church. That happens at the local church that you belong to. But oftentimes, it's just we're living our lives mostly out there in the world. And God has given us gifts to be able to use to edify the body of Christ, to build people up. For some of us, it's sharing the gospel and watching people come to the Lord. For some of us, it may very well just be a word of exhortation or edification or a correction or rebuke, shining light on somebody's difficulty that they're having in life through sharing scriptures and different things like that. And so you should know that you have a gift or gifts, and those gifts are to be used to edify the body of Christ. Now, he mentions this other one where he says you're going to be baptized in fire. And there's a lot of confusion about what that baptism in fire is. I mentioned it two weeks ago when I was sharing that the baptism of fire is as we go through difficulties, the Lord purges us. He cuts off the stuff that doesn't look like Christ. And so as a Christian, when you gave your life to the Lord, this word or this work of sanctification began where God was setting you apart to himself 
and from the world. And he does that through circumstances. He does that through life. He does that through, unfortunately, suffering. And so you and I will be judged when we enter into heaven as Christians. What? Wait, what? You and I will be judged when we enter into heaven. We'll never be judged for condemnation as a Christian. But we will be judged for what we did with the life that God gave us. And so the moment <clears throat> that we gave our lives to the Lord, God has good works with your name on them. According to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, the Bible says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, before the foundations of the world. There are good works with your name and my name on them. And so he's gifted you so that you would take those very gifts that he's given you and walk in obedience to what he's calling you to do with those gifts. So I get this from, and this is interesting because as I was studying these last two weeks on this topic, People are very confused about this. And they want to say that this baptism of fire is a baptism. Just all kinds of stuff I was reading. And I was like, no. No, not at all. The totality of Scripture is a test to what this is. Let me read it to you. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Starting at verse 10, the Bible says, According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is, if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so is through the fire. And so we're not going to be judged with this fire for condemnation. Jesus took our condemnation upon himself on the cross. So we'll never be judged for hell. We'll never be judged for condemnation as Christians. He bore that on the cross for us. But we will be judged, and there should be a motivation there. Well, yeah, I just kind of like, I'm a private person. I just do me, and I don't really like to, you know, I don't like my religion or my Christianity to kind of be out there in the public forum. It's the only reason God saved you and kept you here. So that your Christianity can spill out. This is God's will for you and for me. There are no private Christians there's no such thing. Think about it again. In first century AD, if you were baptized as a Christian, you were identifying with Jesus and it was a death march. And we can't even live for the Lord? 2022? That'd be, that'd be embarrassing. We're going to stand before God and we're going to give an account for this life. What changed Pastor Chuck Smith's life? He was at a conference. His desire was to be a medical doctor. He was at a conference and he heard a poem. And the poem was, Only one life soon will pass. Only what's done for Christ is going to last. And the Lord began to tug on his heart. And he said he had this internal conversation. His mom knew it all along because his mom had raised him with the idea of what God had revealed to him. His sister was going to die. She carried her lifeless body to this church. And God healed his, his sister. And she promised God, I will give you my life if you heal my daughter. And she said, I will give you my life through Chuck. I will raise this boy with nothing but Bible stories. And his entire life will be dedicated to you. He didn't grow up with Disney. He didn't grow up with the heroes of the cartoons. All he grew up with was Bible stories. He's at a conference. He has a desire to be a medical doctor. And he hears that poem. And God begins to tug on his heart. Only one life soon will pass. Only what's done for Christ is going to last. And God began this conversation internally with Chuck. And he said, now I, God was telling me like, Chuck, you can become a medical doctor and you can help people in this life. Or you can become a pastor and you can help people for eternity. And he said that changed the trajectory of his life and from that day on. And he went home from that conference. It was a, a high school youth conference. And he said he went home from that conference and he thought his mother was going to be upset. He said, Mom, I got something to share with you. Oh my gosh, I hope you're not mad at me. 
I was at this conference and God spoke to my heart and He told me that I can help people being a medical doctor. And I know that that's your dream for me, Mom, that you want me to be a medical doctor, but I believe the Lord is calling me to be a pastor. And she said, Chuck, from the very beginning of your life, I knew that this was the call of your life. I had told God that I was going to surrender you to Him if He saved your sister. I took her lifeless body into a church. The pastor prayed for him and raised your sister up. And I committed you to God from that moment on. So son, this is a fulfillment of my prayer for you. And so his whole life was given over to eternity and eternal things. And he has seen many, many come to the Lord. So God has given us this life to invest into eternity with the gifts that we've been blessed with. And again, most of us are not going to necessarily serve in the local church. We can. Most of us live the majority of our life out there, don't we? And so God wants to use us again with the gifts that He's given us as a mouthpiece to represent His truth to a lost world. So that baptism of fire then is suffering and the difficulties that we go through and being molded and shaped into the image of God. And in the midst of that, man, we're learning that we are becoming more Christ-like. We're becoming Christians. We're becoming what God wants to make us into, transforming us from the inside out. And every single one of us should be experiencing that. Every single one of us should be experiencing a transformation as Christians from the inside out. Let me read you some of the others and then we'll close with this last section in Matthew's Gospel. So we have water baptism. These are the nine that I was able to kind of come across. Water baptism, we see that with John the Baptist. We have water baptism, Jesus and the disciples. Those are throughout the Gospels. We have this baptism of suffering that I mentioned. Water baptism in the name of Jesus. I found that one interesting. In the book of Acts, there's a group that were uh, baptized in the name of Jesus. There are churches that call themselves in the name of Jesus only. Uh, the Great Commission found in all of the Gospels and the book of Acts. But the one that we're familiar with is Matthew chapter 28. Go into all the world and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you. Um, baptism is immersion, as I mentioned. It's full immersion. It's never been sprinkling. And however you're baptized, whatever formula, um, again, baptism isn't a saving element. It's just an obedience to what God is calling you to. And so... If you either were baptized in the name of Jesus only or in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, then uh, whatever flavor floats your boat. I believe that it's Matthew 28, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Um, but that's how I baptize. I baptize according to the obedience to the scriptures and what the Bible says. Um, but there's, again, some that hold to this Jesus only baptism. Uh, baptize him in water with the Holy Spirit will end on that one. Baptize him to Moses was an interesting one. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 1 through 4 we see that the nation of Israel was baptized into Moses' ministry where the cloud, the pillar of the cloud, uh, the pillar of fire that led them in the wilderness and that was immersed into Moses' ministry. Uh, baptism for the dead. An interesting obscure scripture in 1 Corinthians 15 29. Paul would take this random practice that was taking place coming out of again Babylon and just a weird practice that was being done and he mentions it there um, and I think baptized into Christ I mentioned that one I think those are the nine I have so let's look at this water baptism that Jesus is now identifying with us as humanity this is very important in fulfillment for Isaiah chapter 53 Jesus now is going to fulfill the scriptures here. Verse 13, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me. John recognizes there is no sin in Jesus. He recognizes his sinfulness and his need to be baptized to Jesus, but yet Jesus is coming to him, and so it's throwing John off. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so for now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. And again, I believe that this is in fulfillment to Isaiah chapter 53. He was numbered with the transgressors, the Bible says. 
And so he's identifying with sinful humanity. Having no sin of his own, he is going to represent us on the cross. And that's what Jesus is doing here. Verse 16, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so out of fulfillment of what needed to take place, Jesus is identifying what, uh, with us sinful humanity in his baptism. His ministry hasn't even started. And the voice of the Father comes from heaven and says, This is my beloved Son in the original group in whom I am already well pleased. I believe the answer to that is found in John's Gospel, chapter 8, where Jesus would say, I always do that which pleases the Father. And so it's not so much what we're doing for God as much as this relationship that we have with God that pleases Him. Jesus was connected to the Father. Now, you have an interesting dynamic here. You have the Holy Spirit, you have the Father, and you have Jesus being baptized. The doctrine of the Trinity is a very difficult doctrine to fully take in, but the Bible teaches that there is one God revealed in three persons, distinct and individual from one another. The Father is not Jesus. Jesus is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. These are three distinct entities, persons, personalities within the Scriptures. And we can draw a lot of conclusions, but I think the greatest conclusion that we can draw from the doctrine of the Trinity is the self-sufficiency of God. And this is a very important thing because we live in a very, very confused world. Maybe you've heard messages or you've heard stories like, you know, heaven is just incomplete without so-and-so being there. As if God needs so-and-so. Fill in the blank. And that so-and-so could be me or it could be you. Nothing could be further from the truth. God was perfectly joyful and content in all eternity past. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, dwelling in perfect unity, complete and fulfilled and satisfied in one another. The Trinity needed absolutely nothing. The Bible declares that we need God. God does not need us. And that is an assault on humanity today. We somehow think that God is in need of something. And today I see people shaking their fists at God and having the audacity to question God. God needs nothing. You were and I were created, the Bible says, according to Revelation chapter 4, we were created for His good pleasure. And here's the secret to life. You live in conformity to bringing God pleasure and you receive in return pleasure because God will be a debtor to no man. You were created to bring God pleasure. Bring God pleasure and live a satisfied, fulfilled life. Live outside of that and live miserably. And so I think that's a very important understanding for us to understand, to take into consideration. God doesn't need us. God created us for His pleasure. When we live in light of living for God's pleasure, we in turn receive incredible pleasure. And so the doctrine of the Trinity. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this incredible plan that you have. And we thank you for your nature, for your character, Lord, for who you are, the self-sufficient one, the all-satisfied one. I thank you so much, Lord, for this incredible plan that you have to desire to spend eternity with us, to give us a life, Lord, worth living, a quantity of life, a quality of life. That is what everlasting life is. We can live out eternal life here and now as we experience in the abundance that you have for us. And Lord, it's a journey, it's a process, and it begins the moment that we surrender our hearts to you. It begins, Lord, the moment that we acknowledge you as the God of the Bible, the creator of the universe. And we begin this relationship with you. 
And so thank you so much for the work of your spirit, Lord. Thank you for the simplicity of the gospel. You taking our place upon the cross. Because in and of ourselves, Lord, we fall short of your glory. The standard of perfection. And so thank you so much for who you are, what you've accomplished, and what you desire to do in and through our lives. Lord, may we surrender and trust that you have an incredible plan for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Do me a favor. Let's stand for this last song, please.